Intel released their 12th generation desktop lineup on November 4th, and they caused quite a stir against AMD. Now, I don't think they've been getting the attention they deserve, so I decided to pick one up for myself, and today I'm gonna do a build with it. Let's get started. Hey YouTube, what's going on? I'm Danny with Danny's Tech Channel. If it's your first time here, your first time to the channel, uh, I like to do hardware reviews, sometimes how-to videos, and then every now and then I'll do a full PC build just like this one. Today's build is all centered around the Intel 12th generation CPU lineup, specifically the i5-12600K. This processor is part of a hybrid chip design it has big cores and little cores on the same chip. The big cores are considered the performance cores and the little cores are the efficiency cores. The 12600K has six performance cores and four efficiency cores. Intel has laid this out kind of strange. This is a 10 core, 16 thread chip. The way they get that number is they take the six performance cores, add it to the four efficiency cores to get your 10. And then you've got hyper-threaded cores, which are the six performance cores. So that gives you 12 hyper-threaded cores. And then you have to count your four efficiency cores once again, because they're not hyper-threaded. So you've got your 16 threads. Clear as mud, right? but it really doesn't matter how Intel is making this happen with their performance cores and their efficiency cores. However it's working, it is working, and they've won back the gaming crown for now. I wanna do a quick outline of these parts and then I can get this build put together. Like I already said, the build is centered around the Intel i5-12600K. It's 10 cores, 16 threads, and boosts all the way up to 4.9 gigahertz. The motherboard that I chose is the ASUS Tough Gaming Z690 Plus Wi-Fi D4 motherboard. The D4 stands for DDR4. This is a DDR4 motherboard, not DDR5, because who can get their hands on DDR5 anyway? To cool the CPU, I decided to go with the Corsair H115i Pro 280mm liquid cooler. I've used this in a couple builds already. This is actually my like go-to CPU cooler for all of my test benches because it's a 280 millimeter cooler and it does a really good job at cooling all of the high-end chips that I've got here in the studio. For RAM, I decided to go with Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro. It's 16 gigabytes, two eight gig sticks. It's got the nice RGB bling on it and it runs at 3200 megahertz. In case you can't see it back here, I'm using the ASUS Tough Gaming RTX 3060 graphics card. This is a 12 gigabyte graphics card. It's got more than enough power to run our 12600K here. For storage, I'm using the Samsung 980 Pro SSD. It's an NVMe drive, one terabyte of storage, plenty of space for our games, and it's a PCI 4.0 drive, which I'll be able to take advantage of using the Intel 12600K. For power, I'm using the Corsair RM850X power supply. It's 80 plus gold, it's fully modular. It's got plenty of power to be able to handle any upgrades I decide to do down the road. And it's just a really nice power supply overall. I highly recommend Corsair products if you can't tell. And finally, the case, This is the Fractal Design Torrent. This is a very large ATX case. I've done a few videos on this already. If you wanna check them out, I'll leave them below or I'll link them up in the YouTube card here. I love this case, absolutely love it. Gamers Nexus did a full 2021 best cases review and they dubbed this as the best overall case. So fantastic case. If you can get your hands on this thing and you've got the space on your desk, I highly recommend it. But I'm building in this thing today and I think it's gonna do great for all these components at keeping them cool and having plenty of storage for all of it. These are all the parts I'm using. I can't wait to get this thing put together. I'm so excited, so I'm just gonna get started on this. Okay, I figured I'd just talk my way through this this time. Just something different. I usually do B-roll. Maybe I'll do a combination of both if I, if I mess things up, but I always put my motherboard on the motherboard box. It's safer and you're not messing with the bottom of the board or anything. Flip your little handle up and then the whole bottom will come down here. You just drop it down onto there, have your little triangle facing the bottom left corner of this. Then you're gonna flip your cover back up. I'm gonna take this off because I've seen people struggling with this lately. And then you just make sure it locks onto it, push the bar down and the whole thing is seated. Take the two screws off for your M.2. Make sure you took your uh, little plastic cover off of the heat sink here. Take my M.2 storage. It's gonna slide into the slot on the left-hand side there. And then I'm just gonna push down on it and lock it in using this little slide tab. I demonstrated this in the review video of this motherboard. 
So if you wanna see that in action, just uh, check it out on there. See this right here, dim A1, A2, B1, B2, and then it's got a little number one. That shows you in a bracket where you should put your first two sticks. If you're only using two, you're only gonna use two of these little, and they're color coded. You can see they're gray or black. So I'm gonna use that channel there and put them in the gray. Just gotta slide them down and click them in. Very simple. So the motherboard's pretty much done at this point. So this is one of the cool parts about the ASUS motherboards. These holes have double holes in them. ASUS thought of the idea that everyone's gonna have the old generation coolers, the LGA 1200 and the LGA 1151 and 50, you know, those coolers are gonna be one hole, one set of holes, and the LGA 1700, which is what this socket is, is gonna be the other holes. But the neat thing about the Corsair coolers that I have, these slide back and forth these little mounting bracket holes. When I put this in the back here, I can use either one if I wanted to. Now I got the motherboard standoffs. I'm actually going to screw them into the mounting bracket that came through the motherboard. Next thing to do is get it put in the case. Another thing that I like to do is take all the panels off of these cases before I start to work. The back is just a quick release glass panel. And then when it comes to the front, push on both sides and the whole thing hinges outwards. Now for this build, I'm actually removing these 180 millimeter fans because the liquid cooler has to go in the front or the bottom. There is no space in the top for the liquid cooler. I think this case is more designed for custom liquid cooling or air cooling. There's no space up top to be able to put fans or anything. Like normally I would put a radiator up here and then liquid cool down to the CPU, but there is no space up top. It's not recommended to put the radiator in the bottom. You want your pump lower than what the actual radiator itself is. They include this box with brackets so that you can mount 140 mil or 120 mil fans in the front. Oh, oh yeah, that's easy. The next thing to do is to install the motherboard. I decided to get that put in before I continued on here. The CPU cooler obviously has to be mounted to the front. I like to use thermal pads instead of thermal paste on all my builds because it's just easier for me to clean up later and I don't have to keep buying thermal paste all the time. That's one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about is the CPU cooler. Will it fit? Will my old cooler fit the new socket type? Is it gonna cool properly? I guess we'll find out. As you can see, the radiator is mounted in the front now. And you can see here the way the tubing is routed. I got the two fans in the front right here, pulling in cool air, cool air from the bottom, and then my pump and block housing and everything is right here on the top. I took the GPU bracket covers off here. I'm actually gonna put the GPU in for a second. One of the things this case has as a feature is the GPU sag bracket. Next is gonna be the power supply, and then you just get to tuck it in the top. It's actually really easy. All right, now I gotta plug everything in to the motherboard and then get this all cable managed. So I'm just gonna do a quick time lapse of that because this is way too much work.
Okay, I'll get the obvious out of the way first. I am wearing something different because today is a new day. We've got plenty of numbers here, so let's take a look at these benchmarks. All the games that were tested were ran on 1080p max settings with no ray tracing and no DLSS enabled. These results are a three run average between all the games, so let's take a look. The first game played was Apex Legends. I love keeping this in the benchmark suite because it's a really stable game. It rarely has any kind of problems or anything. And it's just a fast paced, high FPS first person shooter game. Plus I really love to play it. On the 12600K system with the 3060, Apex Legends ran 140 FPS average with a 1% low of 101.6 FPS and a 0.1% low of 56.7 FPS. That's a good number. It's close to the magic 144 FPS. I'll take it. Next game up is Battlefield 2042. This number tanked a little bit compared to Apex Legends. In fact, it's like halved. On Battlefield 2042, we achieved a 77 FPS average with a 1% low of 44.2 and a dip of 15.6 for the 0.1% low. 77 FPS is still smooth enough for me, but if you really wanted to get high frame rates, you'd have to change your settings. I mean, I ran everything at max settings. If you turn it down to high or medium, your frame rate is gonna shoot up, obviously. A new game I've added to the benchmark suite is Forza Horizon 5. This game just came out not too long ago. It's a really graphically intense game. I love how it looks. It doesn't matter what resolution you use, whether it be 4K or 1080p, it looks great on all of them. They did a fantastic job on this game. Forza Horizon 5 ran 66 FPS average with a 1% low of 36.2 and a 0.1% low of 34. So I thought that one was really neat. It's a built-in benchmark, obviously. The last game that was ran was Halo Infinite. This came up with an average of 98.5 FPS with 61 FPS for the 1% low and 39.4 for the 0.1% low. Halo Infinite's another new game. I was really impressed with it so far. I think they did a great job and it feels like the old school Halo games at heart. 1% low and 0.1% low is the average FPS for the worst 1% or 0.1% of the frame time recorded. Just to give you a basic idea of what it is. Let's talk about the final notes for this 12600K and 3060 build in this gigantic case. Don't forget. The 12600K is an awesome CPU. It really performs well. It's definitely optimized for Windows 11. And that's what I used on this benchmark suite, by the way. This system has Windows 11 installed because Windows 11 takes advantage of the Intel scheduler that they have built into the CPUs. Uh, and they just work really well together, supposedly. The CPU temps were great. The AIO, the Corsair H115i Pro, does an awesome job at cooling this thing. It's making good contact, believe it or not. The temps that I saw in gaming, it never passed like 60C. Most of the time it stayed in the low 50s, and that's while gaming, so I was pretty impressed with that. If you're worried about whether your CPU is gonna be able to work with your old cooler or anything, most likely it will. They're selling brackets for these things made for the new CPUs that you can get with the coolers now, but you honestly don't need it if you have something like this with an adjustable bracket. One little side note with the case and building, I know I outlined a lot of this in the case review, so you can go check that out if you want, but one thing I got to take advantage of with this build is the GPU sag bracket in the corner there. This card has really bad GPU sag, believe it or not. I know it's not an ultra powerful card compared to like a 3080 or a 3090, but the cooler is really big. I think they use the same cooler for all the GPUs now or similar ones. And the Tough series is a very long and fat cooler. Because of that, it creates a little bit of sag on the end. It's actually a good amount of sag, but that GPU sag bracket really helps out. It's easy to push it up and lock it in. However, to get to the back screws to actually mount it, your cable channel on the back is right in the way of where that mounting bracket goes. So I think they could have thought that out a little bit better, maybe move the cable management over. Last thing I really liked about the case, cable extensions, make it happen. If you don't already have them, they're not very expensive and they make the computer look way different. I tried it initially with off camera with the regular cables and it just looked hideous. I hate having those extra cables hanging off. So finally, I'm really happy with the performance of the i5 12600K, as I said, great performance and everything, but as far as the performance over last generation stuff, I don't see that much of a difference. Hey, real quick, this is future Danny talking. I already filmed the video and everything and I decided to try this out real quick. I have a system here. This is like my personal system. It's got an i9 9900K and an RTX 3060. 
uh, non-TI, just the 3060, just like the system that I just built. It gets the same frame rates as the 12600K. I just played Apex Legends and I'm getting the exact same frame rate that I was with the 12600K. So when you decide to play high frame rate games, you need to turn the settings down because it doesn't even matter with the GPU at that point being your bottleneck. So my point is when it comes to gaming, the CPU really doesn't even matter unless you're talking about something really old like the system I used last week. Just wanted to give you that tidbit of information. Let's finish the video. Like Windows works great and everything. I guess the efficiency cores and the performance cores do what they're supposed to do, but it might all be in my head. I really didn't notice a different Windows experience between this Ryzen 5000, Intel 10th gen, Intel 11th gen. I've tried all of them and they all really feel similar. Are you better off buying last generation stuff? You might not have those early adopter problems that 12th gen is gonna have with the new scheduler and Windows 11 because you pretty much have to have Windows 11. At least that's what they say. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to hit like down below and subscribe for more video content just like this. I do other builds and I do in-depth reviews on parts like the 12600K. And as I always say, I'm Danny with Danny's Tech Channel and I'll see you in the next video. Cause I don't wanna lose you I hope you feel that way too No, I